I start recorded. Alan, you can take it away. Hi, Thank thanks, Ian. Um, uh, my name is Alan Tashira, and uh, I'd like to, to welcome everybody here um, again for another interesting session. This one's going to be led by Paul Zarowin, um, and we're going to talk about uh, R&D accounting, earnings management, and investment efficiency. A little bit of housekeeping, if you can keep your, um, your mics on muted unless um, you're asking a question. Um, and it's be good to have your videos on so we can actually see you. And Paul's quite happy to take questions and comments throughout the presentation. So over to you, Paul. Okay. So uh, the basic idea here is when companies, in this case, are mandated to switch from expensing all their R&D to capitalizing, now it's the D, only the D gets capitalized. Um, that has, we want to test, that has implications for how they manage earnings to meet benchmarks. And as I hope to convince you that they reduce their real cutting. Remember, there are a number of papers that show that when companies need to reach an earnings benchmark, such as analyst forecast or zero earnings target, they will cut back their R&D expenditures, their real investments, okay? And we wanna look at what are the ways that they can do that, okay? Or they can still manage earnings, even though they cut back on their cutting, they reduce their cutting, okay? So what is the mechanism that they can manage earnings once they start capitalizing, or at least use R&D to manage earnings? And given that they change their uh, real investment behavior uh, by reducing their cutting, is that going to have an effect on their R&D investment efficiency? Okay, so that's the basic idea, all right? So there's the accounting rule change, the effect on earnings management behavior, and what are the real effects that follow from that? Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so what's the background here? In 205, the UK switched from UK GAAP to IFRS, okay? Under UK GAAP, firms had the option of expensing or capitalizing. Notice I emphasize the word development expenditures. So on, under all regimes, the R part, the research must be expensed, okay? Under UK GAAP, companies had a choice of capitalizing or expensing the D, assuming it meant cer met certain conditions, okay? Uh, but now under IFRS, they were mandated to capitalize the D that met those conditions. So that was a big, a big change, okay? So expensers, we call them expensers because they expensed in the pre-period, the UK gap period, were mandated to capitalize development expenditures, okay, if the expenditures met certain conditions. So basically, you had to pass some kind of, I think of it like a beta test. You know, do you have a viable, saleable product? Uh, I, th I think to think of it as a positive NPV project is a useful way to think about it. Now, if you had development expenditures, but they did not get past that threshold, those expenditures had to be expensed just like the R, just like the research, okay? So we have two groups of firms that we want to look at. Switchers were former expensers. They expensed everything on the UK gap. They now started to capitalize the D. And expensers, firms that had expensed everything under UK gap and continue to expense everything under uh, IFRS, okay? Why did they continue to expense? Either they had no D, everything was R, or their D did not meet the conditions for capitalization. Okay. Now, one question that sometimes com comes up in this is if some firms continue to expense, how can you call it a mandate? Okay, because that's a big part of our story that this was a mandate, this was not an option. Okay. And my answer is you can look at the rules, but even beyond that, okay, uh, in a previous paper that I did with um, Oswald, we looked at every single expenser that has continued to expense, okay? And we looked at all this, like a hundred and something firms, I don't remember the exact number. We looked at all their R&D footnotes and they talk about it and they say in so many, you know, or not so many words, we didn't meet the conditions. Our, our expenditures are, um, are too uh, conditional on, you know, what's gonna happen. They're too volatile. We may not, uh, you know, may not get to that, that point, okay? So in their own language, they're very clear uh, on that. Uh, in addition, at the time of the mandate, 205 to 206, uh, you get quite a number of firms switching, okay? So it would have to be, you know, just like a, an incredible coincidence that they all switched at that time, okay? In addition, for every firm that did switch, 
that became a, we'll call a switcher. Okay. Um, in the first year of IFRS 206, they had to publish at the end of that year what their pro forma capitalization numbers would have been the year before, right? Before the year before the switch, the last year of UK gap. Why is that important? It's important because if they can produce those numbers, that means they could have switched before, but they didn't. Okay. So we think there's a, a, a lot of evidence uh, that points to the fact that this was a mandate. Uh, it did have teeth. Enforcement was effective. And it was it was not an option. Okay. There was also a third group of firms, capitalizers, firms that even under UK GAAP had capitalized the D. Okay. Unfortunately, for, for these tests, there are too few of those. Uh, once you start uh, disaggregating uh, firms into various uh, earnings management buckets, you know, as you'll see, there are three buckets. Uh, there's just too few capitalizers to work with. Okay. And some of the cells, you actually have zero firms. Okay. Um so, yes. So, so that's got a question, I think. Yes. Hello. Hi there. Uh, so, we hand up. Unmute yourself, Ben. Yeah, yeah. I'm unmuted now. So, uh, just because companies say they don't meet the uh, standards doesn't mean that they do not meet the standards. It could be cheap talk. So, um, how do you actually confirm that they do not meet the standards? For example. Adobe is required to capitalize software under FAS 86, but yet has yet to capitalize anything under FAS 86. Yeah, so I, I can't prove that to you, but I can say that given that we did look at every single footnote for the firms that did not switch, okay, and they're explicit about it. Now, could they, quote unquote, lie, you know, as you said, cheap <laughs> talk? You know, that's always possible. So that, I mean, I, I can't prove that, but I think the weight of the evidence does argue for for a, a mandate with teeth but you're right i mean you know it's it's possible that uh something that's you know the in the gray area between r and d uh they could say well it's really r you know uh, so uh, you know in terms of absolute proof i i could not give you that but i but i do think there's a lot of evidence that that uh it was a mandate with teeth I, I think we did everything we could do to, to be convincing. Okay. okay so what are our... Uh, oh, our sorry, ben, Benjamin, yes. do you want to do yes. this while we're at the break? Thank you, hey, Paul. Uh, so along the same lines, and I, I understand and I even accept your answer, but just a little pushback. If I recall correctly, a, a requirement to capitalize, one of the criteria is intent. And... I think it was intent to finish the project or intent to sell it. So I'm, I'm just pointing out that if companies wanted to manipulate it, it is quite easy to say we're not sure, right? And it will be a legitimate thing. We don't know what the market would be when we finish the project. So I'm, I'm pointing out that I think may, maybe the fact that you went through the footnotes is, is, is helpful to show that companies do not use it, but, but they have a very easy out. Okay. I, again, you know, companies have a lot of leeway under, you know, all gaps, right, including IFRS. And I'm sure that you're right, that there is, you know, fudge room, so to speak. Okay. Uh, but I, again, I, I, I think that, you know, the UK is probably, you know, the one capital market that's considered close to the US in terms of, of uh, rigor and enforcement, etc. So, uh, you know, the fact that the switchers did switch at the time of the mandate and not earlier, um, you know, we could debate this forever. And I, I couldn't swear on a stack of Bibles that, you know, it is absolute, but I, but I think, you know, we did everything we could do to, to show that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is, is that, is that okay, Ben? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, what do we find? Hi, Paul. Yes. Well, I, I just have a clarifying question. Yes. May you share with us uh, what are the conditions uh, are needed oh, uh, in the, to, to classify it as D? Yeah, uh, all those the, are, yeah. I don't remember them by heart. They're in the paper. I apologize. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but it essentially amounts to, you know, you pass this beta test and you've, you know, you've uh, what Ben said, you've, uh, you've got a product that is saleable. Okay. Uh, okay. So what do we find? 
we find that switchers reduce their probability of cutting R&D expenditures to meet benchmarks. We look at the usual benchmarks, but they did not reduce their probability of cutting R&D expense, okay? So how could they cut their expense without cutting expenditures? Okay, we find that when they get into the bucket that they want to, uh, they need to cut back their expense to uh, manage their earnings above a threshold, they increase the percentage of expenditures that they capitalize, okay? And we also find that the switchers increase their investment efficiency. But here's an important point. Um, only switchers that were in that earnings management bucket where they reduce their expenditure cutting, those are the only ones that increase their investment efficiency. So it's very local, it's very, it's very targeted. Okay, so the way the way we think about this is, you know, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the, the famous Graham Harvey Ragsapal paper that uh, you know managers admit that they cut back profitable investments to meet earnings targets. Okay, so if capitalization of the D enables firms to reduce that wasteful cutting, you know, then they would increase their investment efficiency. So that's the way we uh, that's the way we think about it. Okay, um, so what's our contribution? Uh, so we link the R&D expensing versus capitalization, the accounting method. So we link the accounting method to the type of earnings management, okay? Reducing real expenditures or just expense, okay? Uh, we show that the earnings management tool that the capitalizers use is the percentage of cost capitalized. And we look at the economic consequences, i.e. focusing on investment efficiency um, with archival data. There are some papers that looked at this, um, such as the... Uh, uh, Stephen Terry and re related uh, stuff that uh, has been done recently uh, with simulations, uh, but we actually use our carval data. So I think we're the only ones to kind of put that whole thing together. Okay, what's our motivation? Okay, very straightforward. Uh, when you expense one-to-one -one effect of R&D expenditure cut on pre-tax earnings. So if you cut back a dollar of expenditure, you increase pre-tax earnings by a dollar. But when you capitalize, some fraction of those costs get capitalized, expenditures get capitalized. So there's less than a one-to-one -one effect. How much less, of course, depends on the percentage of cost that you capitalize, okay? So in a capitalization regime, cutting back real expenditures can hurt firm value if they're positive NPV. That's the Graham Harvey Rajapal story, okay? Um, but it's not going to help you as much with your earnings management, okay? Whereas if you increase the percentage of expenditures that you capitalize, um, rather than cutting back your real expenditures, you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. You can keep uh, making your positive NPV investments and yet you can manage earnings. Okay, so that's basically what our motivation is. Okay. Um, some people might say that there's, you know, what's the tension here? Uh, it's mechanical, right? If you capitalize some costs, uh, obviously, your earnings management benefit is going to be less, so you're going to have less tendency to do it, okay? Uh, but we think there is tension, okay? One is we cannot separate the R&D into R versus D, okay? So even in a capitalization regime, firms might still cut research expenditures, so we're kind of back in the old situation because those are expensed, okay? In that case, we'd find no change in earnings management behavior. Uh, other factors, aside from the benchmark beating uh, effect R&D expenditures. So, you know, we might not be able to find it in the data, even if it's, um, you know, even if it's going on. Okay. So we think there is tension and, uh, you know, moreover, like, you know, no one has shown this. So we think there, you know, there really is a contribution. here. And uh, Paul, we've got a question yes. from Sudipta now. Yeah, Sudipta. So what about amortization of the development or what's the period of which it's amortized? How does it affect our income? Does it flow through R and D or does it flow through amortization? Yeah, it flows through amortization. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get that number. That's a good point. You could presumably they could you know lengthen the amortization schedule, let's say, uh, but we were not able to determine that. But that's a good point. We were not able to to, to find that out. Yeah, so, and, and uh, one of those things, Paul. The other thing is that the R and D is just one aggregate number in IFRS. They don't actually separate between current expenditure and the amortization component. It's just one one disclosed number. Yes, thank you. Um, so that would be great to be able to break that out, but you know, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, and Ayang, and then Zach. Hi, Paul. Uh, I I just kind of have a follow up question about those conditions. So, like, I think the 
the takeaway from the, your results is that you think those are real earnings management regarding whether R and Ds are expensive versus capitalizing. But I'm thinking about like those convictions required to be capitalized. It's kind of very subjective, really depending on managers' belief on whether they can probably predict future cash flows and whether the project will be successful. So I'm thinking about whether it's actually a simpler story. It's, it's not manipulating earnings. It, they're just signaling the type of the projects they have, which is not observable to the outsiders. And then the ones they signal will be successful, they continue investing, but the ones they have lower likelihood of reaching the successful outcome, they expense. So it's just consistent with what they believe about the type of the project they are working on. Yeah, so that's a good point. So if if uh, if firms wanted to signal that they have projects that are far along, okay, that mm. with a D meets the capitalization conditions, okay, they, they could have done that in the UK gap period, okay? Now, in my previous paper, we find evidence that, or at least we conclude that uh, capitalization was a negative signal because the firms that capitalized in the UK gap regime tended to be weaker financially. Okay. So maybe they needed the expense deferral. Okay. Whereas if you, if you expensed everything, you're showing your financial strength that you didn't need it. Okay. So that's one, that's one argument. I think another argument and uh, I'm looking at this in some research now, is that uh, maybe companies didn't want to reveal that they had projects further along, mm -hmm. right? that uh, in a sense, you know, proprietary information, basically, okay? Mm -hmm. So that might, uh, you know, might have effect affected their behavior. Uh, but yes, I, I agree with you that, on, you know, on the margin, there is a gray zone and you know what go what gets into R and what gets into D is is difficult to to you know to truly truly define. I, I, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Was there another hand there, Zach? You had a hand. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um. So I I had sort of in sort of a related uh, vein, but different. There's some recent evidence showing that companies uh, will you know, not necessarily the, the whether or not it's R or D or is met the threshold, but they'll play with the alternative future use. Criteria. Wait, you say it again, the alternative? The alternative future use criteria under US GAAP. I, I, and I don't know off the top of my head if there's a similar one under IFRS, but basically if there's an alternative future use, companies can capitalize R and D as into property, plan, and equipment. And there's some recent evidence showing that they they sort of play with that a little bit, and they'll cut R and D expense, but then increase their it'll show up in capital expenditures in the big databases. Um, and so I was wondering if you if you had done anything or could think about maybe that trade off. Maybe once you go to IFRS, if you have this requirement to capitalize, you have maybe an additional bucket. So maybe you see companies doing both. Well, we we didn't find any change in behavior with respect to SGNA, okay, which is important because SGNA continued to be expensed. Okay. Right. So it's kind of like a you know placebo type of test. Uh, we did not look at PPE. If you have a certain site that you know, uh, please email it to me because I was not familiar with with that evidence. And I and I'll, I I'll email it to you. I'll email Yes, I would appreciate that. Okay. Because I I was unaware of that. Okay. Should we, should we go on? Uh, one more question. Yes. So, hi, Paul. Um, I was wondering how many firms you have that are doing M&As during your sample period? Because according to the 141R, and I think in, uh, in the IFRS, we have the number three. Um, if you have an M&A, then you can capitalize acquired in process R&D. Um... I don't, I don't know, but my understanding of your question is if you have an M&A, it's kind of an excuse to capitalize, right? right. So, um, so you'll see more switchers. You will see more switchers, uh, but with that, with that 
uh, compromise our earnings management results. If they're capitalizing and they behave the way we find, um, you know, that's what we want. What we want to show. So I, I don't know. That, that's a good. I'm not, I don't know how many M and A's are in there because uh, we didn't we didn't look at that. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that would compromise our results. I don't think that would take away from the fact that if you do switch for whatever reason, mandate M and A, whatever, that your earnings management, if they, if they get into the switch bucket, because we find evidence of capitalized R and D. Uh, and you reduce your cutting of real expenditures, I mean, that, that would still be consistent with what we find. But it's a different way to get to that investment efficiency, right? So it's a, a real effect change behavior where firms are not developing internally, but they are acquiring. So it does yeah. change the investment efficiency. Okay. And a lot of firms nowadays, like especially like in the biomedical field, they are not uh, really doing a lot of internal R and D, but they are more profitable to acquire mm -hmm. that R and D when they know that that D can switch into being capitalized. Okay, so you're saying that could be an alternative. Yes. Reason that we find the investment fit. Okay, that's a good. I did not know, but it's something we should we should check. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we think there's tension. Okay. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, we're going to compare the benchmark beating behavior of switches versus expensers, pre versus post IFRS. Um, so we formed firms, firms into three earnings management buckets. This has you know, been done a number of times in the literature. So uh, group one are firms, for example, if we use the uh, zero earnings benchmark, uh, EBRD stands for earnings before R&D. Um, group one are firms that are doing so poorly that even if they cut back their R&D, they uh, would not have profits. Uh, group three are performing so well they could increase or at least maintain their R&D expenditure level to the previous year and they would still, I'm sorry, uh, at yeah, what it was before and they still have profits. So group two is the interesting group. The only way they could show uh, positive earnings is to cut back their R&D expenditures, okay? Okay, so we're gonna focus on group two because they would show losses if they maintain their expenditures at last year's level, but they can show profits by cutting back. And we also have benchmarks to avoid earnings decreases and meet an analyst forecasts. As I pointed out before, once you start dividing firms into three buckets, uh, you have too few capitalizers to analyze. So we don't look at that. Okay. So our preliminary evidence, um, switchers and expenses, no difference in R&D cut probability pre-IFRS, pre okay? Uh, but switchers have lower R&D cut probability under IFRS, okay? So that's uh, basically down here, if you look at UK gap, okay, we see there's no difference. Um, if you can see my uh, scroll and then difference in the direction we would think of uh, under IFRS. But again, this is all switchers and uh, expenses together. We haven't bucketed them yet, but at least it's consistent. Okay. Okay. So our first hypothesis, firms in group two are no more likely to cut R&D expenditures than Firms in group one or three, okay, are alternative. Expenses in group two are more likely to cut R&D expenditures than uh, expenses in group one or three. Uh, this is not our main hypothesis, just to replicate prior research with U.S. data, such as um, uh, Boucher and uh, Faber et al., okay? Um, so actually, let me just, uh, let me just go to the table. So this is table five, looking at the earnings level uh, benchmark. So uh, focusing on just the cross-section here, so switchers, if you look at the different groups, much more likely to cut R&D expenditures under UK GAAP than either group two or three. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, but we see that if you look at the vertical probability here, uh, this goes uh, down significantly for group two. Okay, once they switch to uh, IFRS, we look at expenses a um, little bit weaker, but uh, they still cut back in, in the uh, earnings management uh, bucket group two. Okay, um, but no change pre post uh, UK gap to IFRS. Okay, uh, the one area we didn't we did not find uh, much results for the earnings change benchmark. Um, we did for analyst forecast. Let me just point out that there's a good reason for this um, because of a UK tax credit um, that uh, firms can 
have larger after-tax income by cutting their R&D expenditures, but uh, receive more tax credits. So when it comes to earnings change, as opposed to zero benchmark, um, they really don't have the same uh, incentive. So uh, the fact that we we did not find results for the earnings change benchmark, I don't think is is really uh, so uh, you know such an alarming alarming thing. Okay, uh, so Dubda, you've got a, a question. Yeah. So this uh, backing out method that you're using from Boucher and others has been shown to be severely biased. There's a paper by Elgers, Pfeiffer, and Porter in JE in 2003, another paper by Lemon Lascarton in RQFA in 2002. And both papers show with simulations that your coefficients are very biased in this approach. When so, you say biased, these are just probabilities here. Those would be biased? Uh, because basically, if you look for a very small gap in this, you know, EBRD, so you can instead of EBRD, you want EBRD close to zero for your test to go through, but you can pick any other number from the income statement and do EB whatever, and you'll find similar results. So the difficulty is that any variable that expense that declines, you would find similar effects for that group. So uh, send me, I'm not familiar with those papers, but let me ask you this. So if that's the case then, why why among switchers would we find the change, but we wouldn't find it for expensers? In other words, it seems to line up, you know, exactly like, like you would think it should, you know, according to the hypothesis, but the danger that you're talking about should show up everywhere, right? Well, it depends on the variance, right? And so, I mean, the result is that it depends on the variance. And here you're saying the switchers are making a bigger change, which I agree, but, um, you know, it affects how you're thinking about that EBRD, right? You're saying you want a really small number for that EBRD conditional on having, you know, a big RD or whatever. And so it's that conditioning part that creates the bias. Okay. Uh, I'm, you know, again, I'll send you the paper so you can. Yeah. Yeah. Think I'm about not it later. That. Um, I see if you're kind of on the knife edge, which is what I think you're talking about mm -hmm. at, that, at that, at that threshold. Okay, uh, we actually, in our multivariate, we do have a, a variable that controls for how much you need to cut back to beat, okay? Um, so maybe that'll hopefully allay some of those uh, concerns, okay? But anyway, looking at this preliminary evidence, we find that in the UK gap period, uh, our results are consistent with, as you said, Baber and Boucher, uh, and they for the switchers, they change but not for the um, expensers. And again, we find the uh, same thing with the analyst, analyst forecast benchmark. Okay, here actually for the expensers, it goes up. Okay. All right. Okay, hypothesis two. Switches in group two reduce their R&D expenditure cut probability. Okay. Uh, alternative is that they do not. Okay. So that was what I basically just showed you. Um, in the, uh, sorry. So basically, expensor versus switchers is middle, middle pile. Okay. So, uh, you know, with the caveat of what Sadipta just brought up, we do find evidence consistent with cha a change in real cutting behavior. And in fact, in the direction of reducing real cutting. Okay. Um, so, uh, takeaway um, how a firm accounts for RD affects how it manages earnings to beat benchmarks. Okay, uh, when we look at, go back, to, I'm sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Um, so it's expenditure cuts. Okay, but we look at expense cuts. Notice the word expense, these are not uh, expenditures. Um, we find that there is no reduction for group two, or certainly, you know, far from statistically uh, significant. Okay, I didn't repeat the uh, the expenses here because, by definition, expensing and cutting real expenditures is the same thing for expenses. So this table is only for the switchers. Okay, and and the takeaway that you see here is that they don't reduce their expense cutting, although we saw that they reduce their expenditure cutting. Okay, so. Um, how do they do that? But first, to try to get at some of the things that uh, Sudipta brought up, uh, we 
didn't just use the uh, uh, probability of cuts uh, univariate. We also looked at a multivariate model, which we got from Berger and Boucher. And um, you know all the usual things. Uh, basically, the revo results confirm our uh, our univariate results. Um, let me just point out this uh, this distance variable. This is how much you have to cut to meet the benchmark. Okay, and it seems to it seems to matter. Okay, that uh, for you your probability of cutting reduced if you have to cut too far. I don't know if that's consistent with what you were saying before. Um, uh, Sudipta. But anyway, I'll have to read those papers because I was not familiar with that. Um, okay, we did a lot of tests for endogeneity. We, do, we personally don't believe uh, identification is an issue here, uh, as I argued strongly before about the mandate itself, although I do recognize there's some problems there. But just in case, uh, there were problems with that and, and uh, identification is an issue. We looked at a bunch of things. We did a bunch of placebo tests where we changed the switch date. So both the pre and the post period are either totally under UK gap or totally under IFRS. And we found no results in that case. So, uh, you know, I think that's powerful. Um, uh, no change in pre to post and uh, let's see, R and D. Oh, yeah, that was table eight. So when we switch the date, we find nothing. We looked at parallel trends. They don't seem to cut uh, to change their cutting behavior uh, in the years before IFRS. Um, uh, so you know, the parallel trends works for us. I mentioned SGNA before. Um, SGNA expenditure cutting behavior does not change. Okay, from pre to post. Which is uh, you know important because SGNA continued to be expensed, so we would not expect a change. So all of these placebo tests, uh, you know, I think are consistent with endogeneity not being a problem and supporting the causal interpretation that you know when the mandate came, you companies had to switch their uh, accounting method, and uh, that caused them to switch their earnings management behavior. Okay, Hi, I think you've got a question. Yes. Hi, Paul. Yeah. Yes. I feel like so far, like it's quite convincing that uh, once it's capitalizing, then they don't uh, cut R and D as much, right? Uh, in line expenditures, with expenditures, uh, expenditures, yes. expenditures, expenditures, uh, cash spending. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering that you cite uh, two kind of structural estimation papers by Stephen Terry, and uh, Stephen Terry's kind of dissertation that's uh, from 2015 is forthcoming uh, from Econometrica, and then okay. those two papers mainly try to kind of bring the bringing firm level evidence to the overall economy and try to talk about how does this expensing versus capitalizing will reduce or changes the overall economy's innovation productivity or the production volume. So I wonder that I think it's convincing that your evidence shows that managers in deem manage earnings by cutting expenditures uh, related to this accounting choice, but is there anything you can talk about how big is the economic magnitude uh, that have been safe from switching from expensing D to capitalizing D? Like what's yeah. the macro effect? Yeah, um, we did not look at, at macro effects. Uh, we did have investment efficiency results, which I'll show shortly. Uh, we did not attempt to aggregate, uh, aggregate that. Um, Maybe look at patents is, is a way to to do that. I'm I'm not sure. Um, that would be a good next step. I, agree. I think to try and you know try to build it up to the economy level, uh, especially this is UK, whereas Terry's result I'm pretty sure is US. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that would that would be uh, that would be a good point. Uh, but you know it does take time for patents to come to fruition. So. Yeah. It, it may be hard to find, but that's it's certainly a good idea. You can take it like a, that, that the Google patent has some like filing data or something just even before approval. Just that's oh, the publicly, filing, yeah, yeah oh, that's, that's, that's publicly available. Like uh, Google patent has that, everything, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good point. Answer. Thank yeah. you. Am I going to get a copy of all these notes? But this is uh, this is, that would be good. Okay, yeah. so uh, I'm sorry. 
The Siddhip just, just got a question now. Yes, yeah, Siddhip. So in the US, lots of firms do not report R&D separately because potentially of immateriality. So they don't report it as a separate line item, but they, we know that they are doing R&D because they have patents and other things. Right, so, that's the, um, I can't remember his name, but that was the- Oh, and REAP 2005. Yeah, right, exactly, yes. JE 15. Yeah. So um, the question is, how do what is the UK equivalent of that? Is how much of the R&D are you not observing in your sample? And how does that affect your results? Well, okay, so let's, I, I don't know the answer to how prevalent that, that is in the UK, but if they're, let's say they're secretly doing R&D, but don't report it as R&D, okay? Then the whole earnings management question via R&D would go away, right? Because if they're not reporting R&D, there's no reason. They don't have to change anything in their reporting, right? They don't have to start capitalizing or whatever. No, so, they do because it's part of sg &A, So it's going, going to be included in sg &A. It's just not reported separately as a line item. But the cash has to be accounted for. Okay. So if it's still sg &A, uh, the uh, the evidence we find is that they do not cut back sg &A. Uh, they continue to expense it. I mean, they don't cut back their cutting, I should say. They don't reduce their cutting. Okay? So uh, they still, you know, they're behaving like they did before. Yeah, so, so I mean, that's a separate point that SJDA includes R&D. So I wasn't sure whether you adjusted the SJDA for r and I'm sorry, say it again? The SJDA often includes the R&D. Right, so let's- So did let's you work. remove that or did you not remove that? No, and we did not. Quite... We did... SDNA, we just took the line item from the financial statements. Okay. If, but let me ask you something. If there is R and D buried in that number, okay, and because it was and continues to be expensed, they continue to treat it just like they always did. If they needed to cut it back to meet a benchmark, they did. I don't think that would invalidate our results that when they had to switch the accounting method, their earnings management behavior changed. I think our result would still hold. Am I am I incorrect in that? I'm just having difficulty sort of separating out the effect of R and D and SGNA. That's what I'm saying. That uh, if R and D is part of SGNA in many firms, that's how it's reported in CompuStat, for example. Then you have to adjust the SGNA for R and D if you want to say something about oh, SGNA okay. as being different from R and D. Okay. That's what I'm trying to get at. So let me let, let's call it this. If I don't call it SGNA, but I call it expensed investments, okay, it, it, to be more broad, right, to capture SDNA, R&D, whatever else they might throw in there. It's an investment, but it's expensed, okay? Then we find the behavior doesn't change. So if I'm a, it may not be SDNA purely, but it still is an expensed investment. So I think my earnings management story still goes through. But that's, I, 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 I don't know how prevalent the uh, Cohen Reeb, uh Evidence is in UK. Okay, um, so basically, this is the uh, parallel trends, and we don't find any result until we get up to the uh, actual IFRS year. Okay. Um, we talked about SGNA. We don't find any change in SGNA cutting behavior. Um, okay, so uh, we find that switchers cut their expense without cutting their expenditure. Um, we as uh, Alan pointed out before, we're not able to get at the at the amortization part, but somehow they're managing earnings. They're cutting their expense without their expenditure. So the natural place to look is in how much they capitalize. We call cap percent. See my scroll, the cap percent. So we hypothesize that if they increase their cap percent, that would be a way for them to avoid cutting the expenditure, but still cut the expense okay now we don't know if we uh, well, we find some evidence of this we can't tell whether they're switching the real expenditures from r to d or just labeling them but that that we cannot know okay but we do find some evidence so for example uh we looked at firms going into versus out of group two so we hypothesize that when they go into group two that's the earnings management bucket where they going to want to cut back their expense um, they increase their capitalization percentage um, 
but they when they uh, go out of group two, uh, it's much less. So again, for the two main benchmarks, the level and the analyst forecast, we find significant results in the direction that we would have forecast. Uh, we also looked at just a raw change in capital expenditures. Do you go up or down as opposed to the magnitude? And we find some results of that also, okay? Um, so it seems to be that one way that the capitalizers can uh, manage earnings without, I'm sorry, manage their expense without managing their expenditures is to increase the percentage of costs that they capitalize. So okay. Paul, in that first panel there, is that last column supposed to be a difference because it doesn't seem to be a difference? I'm no, this is, uh, this is the uh, alpha level. This is the alpha level. Sorry about that. I said, yeah, it's not it's not one one two minus oh two. Okay. Uh, okay. So, most importantly, what are the economic consequences? Uh, there's a lot of, I should say, discussion as opposed to evidence that real earnings management is more costly to the firm than accrual earnings management. Now, I, by the way, I've been careful so far to not call. Uh, the type of earnings management that they come to do accrual because it's really it doesn't fit into the way we normally think of accrual earnings management. That's why I called it reducing expenditure cuts. But you can think about it along the spectrum of real to accrual earnings management. Uh, the Terry uh, Whitehead in the Zakal Yukina paper uh, is uh, uh, simulation evidence, and they find uh, somebody mentioned it, and Stephen Terry also finds this. Um, but it's it's all um, you know it's basically simulations. It's not archival evidence on the real cost of earnings management. I don't mean to diminish their evidence, but it's not the archival in, in the way that we normally do it. Okay. So what we're going to look at is the change in R and D investment efficiency for the for the two groups. Okay. And going to regress R and D in investments against uh, that is real expenditures against investment opportunities as as captured by Q. Okay, and this has some precedent in the precedent in the literature, uh, Skinner and more recently Zong. Okay, so we regress R and D investment. This is the total expenditure. Okay, the real okay uh, against Tobin's Q at the beginning of the year. Okay, um, and interactions between IFRS and Switcher and and Tobin's Q. Okay, so we want to look at at that that interaction term. Okay, focusing on on the uh where is it the b the b1 uh tobin's q to, uh, ifrs okay for the for the switchers okay um I'm sorry, yeah so b just captures the oh i'm sorry here it is b0 i apologize b0 okay so look at the sensitivity to tobin's q uh in the ifrs ifrs regime for the switchers that's the incremental effect that we would would find okay Okay, so we start off by looking at the entire sample of switchers versus uh, expenses. We propensity score match them to make sure we're dealing with apples and apples. And basically we do not find anything. Okay, so looking at all the switchers versus all the expenders, we don't find anything. Okay, that's this um, uh, first coefficient in T statistic uh, right there. Okay, but then we go deeper and we look at switches and expenses based on the three profitability groups, because our hypothesis is really that the change in behavior is gonna be focused on the group two bucket, which is reducing its cutbacks, okay? And so we're running the same regression, okay? Um, as you see here, this is for the earnings level benchmark. We find it in group two, we don't find it in group one or three. Uh, again, the change we change benchmark, as I pointed out before, we don't find anything. If we look at the analyst forecast benchmark, again, we find a similar result. So we find it in the uh, bucket where we would expect to find it or ho hope to find it uh, based on the change in earnings management behavior, but not in the other buckets. Okay. Um, in terms of magnitude, uh, we think it's economically important. Uh, our sample results, the typical group two switch has a Tobin's Q of about two. So if we look at the coefficients there, uh, we find an increased investment of about 0.05 to 0.06, which we think is reasonable given uh, mean of, of one five. So it's about a third approximately. Okay, 
Uh, what's the mechanism? That's a, always a big question, okay? Uh, the recent paper by uh, Roy Chowdhury, uh, Schropp, and Verdi mentions a number of mechanisms which all have to do, or since they all have to do with either uh, reducing cost of capital or learning behavior. Um, we don't take a stand on this. Uh, and the reason we don't is uh, all the switchers would have been subject to these kind of learning behavior or reduced cost of capital because they're all disclosing more information. When you capitalize, you're disclosing uh, the not just your expenditure, which you always did, but you're disclosing the percentage of the cost of cost that you capitalize. You're disclosing the amount of your R and D asset. So all switchers, regardless of which uh, bucket they fall into, would have an increased amount of information, both for internal learning and for you know, external um, uh, information that could change the cost of capital, okay? But we only find the efficiency gains in group two, okay? So we think that this is uh, evidence that the switches that were previously underinvesting, and it isn't the new information, but the change in investment behavior. So this really gets back to the um, um, uh, uh, Rajapal, um, uh, uh, Harvey, uh, Graham Harvey Rajapal paper, where managers admit that they reduce uh, positive NPV investments on the margin to beat earnings targets, okay? Um, and we think that that's the, you know, that's where, that's the mechanism going on. It's not any internal learning or more information provided to the market because all of those effects, internal, inf more information would apply to all switchers, but we only find it in the group two bucket. Uh, we did some tests for endogeneity here where we changed the switch date to either two years earlier, so both the pre and the post period were under UK GAAP, or to two years later, so both the pre and the post period were under IFRS. Again, we find we find no uh, no evidence of uh, improved investment efficiency. So we think that um, you know it's it's a real causal effect. Uh, Hi, Ang. Yes, you question. Could. Hello, Hi, Paul. Yes. Uh, probably my last question. Yes. So I've been thinking is that uh, before the mandate, they do have the option to capitalize. Yes. And correct. exposed yeah. after the mandate, you show that those are actually positive MPV projects increasing the investment efficiency. Yes. So my question is, usually we assume managers have superior information about those projects than outsiders. What are the frictions preventing them from choosing capitalization before the regime? I think there are two things, okay? Yeah. In, in my previous paper, we argued that capitalization was a negative signal about profitability, okay? Because the firms that capitalize, this is my RAS paper a couple of years ago, firms that capitalize seem to be economically weaker, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and it makes sense. They need the expense deferral to improve their earnings. Okay, so I think that's one part of it. That that once you have to, uh, once it's a mandate to capitalize, there's no signal anymore. Okay, I think that's one thing. I think the second thing, and uh, I have, I'm starting to do some work on this now, but I don't have strong evidence yet, is that uh, maybe that there are you know, there are proprietary costs involved with revealing that your projects are far along. Okay, and they and they don't want to uh, they don't want to reveal that. Okay. Obviously, once they're forced to, they're they're forced to. Okay, so I think I I personally believe it's a combination of the, the two frictions are negative signal that you needed them that you needed the expense deferral and uh, you you didn't want to reveal that you had these projects farther along. So, do the switches are the switches like randomly from the entire population, or do they tend to be the weaker firms anyway? So then the signal is still there. So yeah. they, they so, miscalculate. So uh, what I showed in my previous paper is that the com co firms that capitalized under uh, UK GAAP definitely were financially weaker. Okay, that that is true. Uh, the switchers, um, I don't remember where to look at those. Um, I, I, I think I recollect that they were younger. Um, on they, average, they, were, they were younger. They were the firms that needed the deferral more. Uh, so anyway, we we, uh, we believe that uh, we find evidence for the increase in investment efficiency. Uh, it's causal. Uh, it's not due to the information related mechanisms. It's due to uh, you know let's call it a reduction in wasteful behavior. 
Okay. And we think it's the first archival evidence on the real cost of real earnings management. Okay, so uh, contributions, just summing up. Um, I think of it as a triangle, if you will. Uh, we link the accounting method to the type of earnings management. Uh, we uh, show how capitalizers manage earnings, and we document that uh, when they capitalize, they uh, increase their uh, investment efficiency. And uh, if you want to make a, somewhat of a leap, you know, obviously this is UK data. We can't say this in the US, but um, it seems that regulations such as SOX, which cause firms to shift to more real earnings management, may have that negative consequence. Actually, that's what Terry's work shows. So I think I'm done. Okay, we've got another question. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Paul. Mm. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you want to reinforce uh, your result, there is a unique set setting that is Germany. So maybe you can replicate exactly what you did uh, for UK with the, a, a, a German sample because they were early adopters in terms of IFRS. Uh, so before 2005. So you can find uh, uh, a sample. Uh, of early adopters with the same issue on R&D. And, and, and then we can see, you can see if you, you can get the same result. Yeah, so there is a paper that, that looked at Germany mm -hmm. and it showed that uh, investment efficiency increased, but there's nothing about earnings management. So the mechanism, how do you get there is absent from that paper. That's what we think ours has the whole, and it has the whole triangle, the man, the, uh, the, uh, accounting rule, the earnings management behavior, and the investment efficiency. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's a, you know, the UK is often considered the closest capital market to the US in terms of, you know, rigor, sophistication, all that stuff. So we thought that this was a good place to go. But you're right. I mean, we could look at, at another country also. Christina? Yes, I agree with uh, Paul that, you know, UK, it's a very good, um, you know, setting for testing your hypothesis uh, because, you know, before the IFRS, the rule was very, very similar. And there was, though, you know, a significant you know, difference that it was quite conservative rule. It says, you know, basically R&D expenses are to be expensed, okay, not to be capitalized, unless you have very good reasons that you really want to capitalize. So, um, and if I remember, you know, I mean, well, you know, there have been a lot of surveys and evidence, you know, very UK specific that say that firms didn't really want to capitalize at that time. Um, I agree so, with that, but I agree with that, by the way, I think there is a reluctance whether it's yes. with a negative signal, whether it's proprietary costs, I think there is a reluctance. And that's yes. why for many, many of these eligible firms that didn't, and they only yeah. did it when yeah. they were forced to. Yeah. But I, I agree. I definitely agree with that. So, so one oh, thing, oh, sorry, you know, yeah, one thing that, uh, you know, I would like to to see, and that's something you know that was going on in my mind for a while, is but I never managed to do it. Is to see the impairments of this capitalized, um, you know, asset. Yeah, that's so what question. happened. Uh, the question is like, okay, so if you claim that it increases investment efficiency, I mean, are we sure this is really good money, good investments? I mean, if they're not good investments, then, you know, we're going to see more impairments after that coming, you know, in being part of the three, four years. It's like the goodwill story. I mean, you know, at some point, you know, we have put a lot of goodwill uh, on our balance sheets. And then, of course, here comes impairments. Well, I, I looked at that uh, in the past, and there, are, there aren't many impairments. All right. Okay. There yes. Very, I never... very few. Very yeah. few. Very, I, I think the reason is because in order to capitalize, you do have to get past a certain stage. Yeah. So, you know, it, I know. it's not like PPE where everything gets capitalized. You have to be past a certain stage. So yeah. you're only going to get to that point if you, you know, you're reasonably certain. Mm. But, but again, I did look at that. There's very few. Okay, then. Good. You know, yeah. and maybe that's kind of being supportive evidence. Like, you know, I mean, you know, you capitalize it, it stays there, it gives us benefits, it doesn't get impaired, it's good money. 
it's a good investment. Uh, yeah. I like to think so. Yeah. It, it may well be that the threshold is very high in IS 38. There, there are seven criteria you need to meet. So it, you have, it's, for example, if you're in the pharma sector, the point at which most companies in Europe will recognize is that when they get approval, so it's um, it's very late in the process before they it's start having any deep. It's interesting you say that, Alan, because when we looked at all those footnotes in a previous paper, it was pharma, which had firms that that continued to expense, which yep. is consistent with what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. So can I just another reason I just want to jump in since before we move to the topic with goodwill, that's an indefinite life asset. And so that's one of the reasons why those balances balloon is because you're not amortizing them over time. So in addition to less being capitalized, it's also being amortized and it, it has a way to get off the books naturally without needing an impairment. Yeah. So, so uh, the UK is also unique in that it allows brand capitalization and Ken has been working on this for 40 years now. So, uh, um, so, uh, and Carl Mueller has a paper, I think, in JE in 2002 or so, where he looks at brand capitalization in the UK. So have you looked at whether the firms that are capitalizing R&D are also changing their brand capitalization? The what, what capitalization is it? Brands. Brands. Advertising expense. So you can uh, capitalize as no, J&A in the UK, I, even though you can't in the US. So there's another difference there that, okay, okay. assuming that sj accounting is the same as in the US, but it's not. Uh, did that change from UK gap to IFRS? No, or did it stay the same? IFRS, you can't capitalize advertising. In fact, there are a couple of agenda decisions that have come out of the IFRS Interpretations Committee that are um, e even things like if you have catalogs, you have to expense them as soon as you receive them. You can't capitalize any of that sort of thing. So you can capitalize a brand on acquisition. So that's back to the MA type thing. So you can bring those in, but, but that's acquired as opposed to self generated. So do I do I understand correctly that that from UK gap to IFRS went the other way from you could capitalize and now you can't? Well, Ken is the expert here, so I'm going to defer to him. But okay, I I uh, if again if there's a paper you said it was a JAE or TAR, uh, I I I I do not know that. I'm sorry, my I'm very poorly read. Um, but uh, Ken has written many papers on this, so yeah. ask Ken. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ken. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything to what you've added. To, to, to. It's, um, it, it did change after IFRS. It was, um, I'm not, it, it was like a kind of a fashion almost for a while, uh, pushed by a number of firms and one consulting firm. But I haven't updated that work from all those years ago. So it's still being cited, <laughs> Ken. Zipto is still, is still citing your work. 20 years later. So let's no. <laughs> scary, isn't it? <laughs> uh, are there any closing remarks or anything? Or I'm not sure what's oh I thought I sent you a closing remark slide. Oh yes, uh, yes, yes. I did. Hold on. <laughs> yes, here it is. Ah, here it is. Yes. So closing remarks. Uh this wonderful uh, ADP will continue. Um, and I think it's really, you know, greatly focused on true accounting, um, accounting measurement and methodology. So uh, please, uh, you have three months, no, actually three, three and a half months to get your papers ready. I hope to have another paper for you, Ayung, okay, and Steve. Um, and here's the, uh, Ayung is easily reached at her Georgetown email. You can see that right here. So uh, please, you know, all interesting I, I remember you even had Stephen Terry present here uh, Stephen Terry presented that 2015 paper yeah so uh I guess we get to a chance to relax for the summer and work on our work and reconvene in September yeah. right yeah sounds good thank so you all. Perfect. great comments uh so we we'll, 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 uh, can you send me all these like in papers in the comments because I yeah, I, I, will. Chat. I yeah, appreciate chat. that Sounds like I have yeah. a lot of homework to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank Steve, you. Steve, do you want to say something? I'm sorry. This is our. Yeah. Yes, I just want to say something as yeah. we close. This is the last, uh, the last uh, ADP for the year, right? Yeah. So but... um, we have to thank a young, for all the fabulous work she does. She does. She does everything, uh, and she's been wonderful. Uh, so we uh, thank you very much, a young, for the effort you put into this. 
this is this is your uh, this is due to your, due to what you have done, and we thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Steve, and thank you all the presenters. Many of you have presented uh, here before, and then we look forward to receiving your new manuscript. You still, like Paul said, you still have three and a half months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I'm gonna stop recording and. Uh,